My name is Liz Collette, and I am the co-chair of this year's Big Bang competition. On behalf of the 2008 Big Bang Organizing Committee, I welcome you to the eighth annual award ceremony for the Big Bang. Tonight is the exciting culmination of a year's work of hard work for our five finalist teams and for the organizing committee. The committee, along with the Graduate School of Management, would like to congratulate each team on their accomplishments thus far and wish them the best of luck as they pitch their ideas to this audience tonight. I would also like to take a few moments to acknowledge our organizing committee. The Big Bang is run entirely by students from the Graduate School of Management, and as you can imagine, it requires a lot of time and effort. To give you an idea of how we got to this point in the competition, I just wanted to go through a quick run through of the year. Uh, the competition begins in the fall with a joint kickoff with Little Bang, which is an opportunity for the future participants to get to know one another and also um, to start assembling a team. The kickoff is followed by a series of workshops and mixers that are put on in association with Innovation Access, one of our partners, and also with Little Bang. This enables team formation and idea exchange. During the winter, participants attend the Entrepreneur's Grill, where they see firsthand how to pitch business ideas to venture capitalists. This is followed by the submission of a three-page executive summary. This year, we've received 28 executive summaries. The summaries are then judged by volunteers and semi-finalists are announced. This year, we moved 18 teams, including 10 from the Little Bang poster competition, onto the semi-finalist business, business plan round. This year, the Big Bang provided mentoring opportunities for our semi-finalist teams, which we'll hear about in just a little bit. These 18 teams submitted business plans up to 35 pages in length, which were again judged by volunteer judges. They were then narrowed down to the five finalist teams who will present to you tonight. Earlier today, the teams presented behind closed doors to a panel of judges. The results of the closed door judging will be revealed at the conclusion of tonight's event. Cash prizes include $15,000 for the winner, $5,000 for the runner up, and $3,000 for the People's Choice Award. You should have a ballot in your program for the People's Choice voting. Tonight, you get to be the venture capitalist. The rules are very simple. Each person receives one ballot and must be present for all five presentations in order to vote. Please vote for the team and the idea that you think is the best, the plan you would want to fund if you were a venture capitalist. Enjoy the program. And I would now like to hand it over to my co-chair, Brandon Hillstead. Thank you, Liz. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors this year, in particular DLA Piper, who is sponsoring tonight's event. Without the generous support of our sponsors, this competition would not be possible. This year, we were able to match teams with mentors who helped our teams along the business plan process. We'd like to thank those mentors who volunteered their time and expertise in helping our teams. We'd also like to thank our judges from the executive summary, business plan, and final rounds. Over 70 judges donated a tremendous amount of time reading and judging all the business plans. We'd also like to recognize our partners, Innovation Access, the Center for Entrepreneurship, and the Graduate School of Management for the support they have given the Big Bang this year. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you the Dean of the Graduate School of Management, Nicole Biggert. This is not the finals of American Idol. However, it is gonna be just as much, if not more fun, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's such an amazing, exciting time. This may be my favorite event all year long. I just, I just love this, the, uh, the learning that goes on, the, the giving that goes on, the money. I mean, it's a really nice, uh, uh, it's a nice, nice combination of things. Uh, I, wanna, I want to um, welcome, I, I see people here from, uh, from all over. I see people who are in the business community, uh, many of my students 
students from, um, uh, from across the campus, there are all people from uh, many different programs here who come and work uh, together, work with, um, with MBA students often. I see a number of uh, my colleagues, vice chancellors and deans, uh, and I understand that uh, Chancellor Vanderhoof is going to, to sneak in at some point. I, don't I haven't seen him, but he's, he told me he was going to come. I mean, it's gotten so important that even the chancellors can't stay away. This is a really important event for, um, for our community at large. I think it's, it, uh, it, it, it has created an entrepreneurial spirit on this campus that is growing. Uh, it's, uh, we've, we've always been a very strong place uh, academically, intellectually, but now we're, we're growing ideas that will go out into the, into the world and make a difference. And we're, we're teaching people, not we, it's really the, because the, uh, faculty are not involved in this except as advisors, um, the business community is teaching what they know. Um, and mentoring students and the, the work of, of faculty in other units um, are, are seeing their students step forward with new, new ways of taking what they've learned in their laboratories and their classrooms and, and seeing how it will work into, in another world other than the world of, of uh, science and technology. So it's, a very, it's very exciting for me to see people from different worlds coming together. We're, all, we're making each other better. Um, and we're, we're, we're helping students to take ideas into the world um, in, in new ways. So it's very exciting for me. Um, the, uh, the Big Bang is, is a, a student-run program. We do a little support, but this is, uh, it's handed off year, uh, each year from one student cohort to another student cohort. And uh, it's been eight years, and it just gets bigger and better. And we have had more people uh, RSVP this year uh, than ever before. I, um, you know, it, it's uh, it's becoming the the place to, the place to be, and I think tonight you are going to see uh, really the proof of what we can do together. When you take smart people with big ideas, you add some business um, savvy and business skills, uh, and bring it together something really magical happens. And I think you're gonna see some evidence of that magic. And it's not necessarily whether these ideas are going to get funded and start a firm, but that the process has is started rolling out in many people who have been touched by, by the year um, of, uh, of learning and of, of, uh, of competition. So it's a really, really big thing. I wanna thank um, Liz and Brandon, the student co-chairs, that's a lot of work. I cannot, it's like a, running a startup. They have to get money, they've got to pitch their ideas, they've got to organize their troops, and they've done a great job this year, so thank you. <laughs> They really run a, run a little army uh, of people to, to make this go. And uh, the sponsors, uh, those, uh, those sponsors who are units of the university and the business community, the legal community, um, who, uh, and the venture community who su su support this uh, with their money and with their time, their talents, um, I, I thank you also. Thank you, Dean Biggert. I would now like to present to you our first team presentation of the evening from Advanced and Logical Closures. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tim Keller. I'm a uh, UC Davis trained winemaker, so I've spent about 10 years in Davis here total now. Don't do the math, please. And uh, <laughs> uh, for the past 10 years, I've been a winemaker. I worked in Napa Valley as well as in Sonoma. Uh, this picture is from Stolzner Vineyards, where I cut my teeth as a winemaker. And tonight we're going to talk about Advanced Enological Closures, which is a company that I have founded uh, for a product that I think my industry desperately needs. As most of you are probably aware, the traditional way of closing a wine bottle is with a cork. Uh, Winemaking practices have co-evolved along with the cork, but corks are, are tragically flawed. If you've ever had a wine, uh, a bottle of wine that was just kind of gross, you probably met this guy. This is 246 trichloroanisole, also known as TCA. The incidence rate of TCA is between 2 and 5% of all wines. And wine being a huge global industry uh, with over $200 billion worth of products sold every year, that means that the damages that this guy causes 
is over $10 billion worth of lost wine. Uh, all of the efforts of the cork industry to eliminate it have failed. It's produced by a mold that lives in the pores of cork. Uh, if you ever get this, it smells like old moldy mop water or gym socks, or it's, it's not good. So think of it this way. If you are going to go buy a bottle of wine because you and your significant other have an important anniversary or something, and you go into the store and you're looking at the shelf, you have a 1 in 20 chance of getting a wine that's already ruined. In no other industry would a failure rate of this level be uh, tolerable. But in wine, there's been no really other options, so we kind of live with it. In the early 90s, the wine industry started experimenting with some alternative closures, most likely synthetic corks and screw caps, but they themselves uh, are not perfect. To understand that, you have to realize that wine is a living, breathing sort of organism. Over time, it needs oxygen that it can absorb and it can help polymerize tannins. This is the process of, uh, of bottle aging or, or maturation as wines become softer in the bottle. And wines will require oxygen no matter what you do. So if you do not provide enough oxygen, then wines become reduced. And wines that are reduced smell like uh, burnt rubber or matchsticks, uh, something like that. If you allow too much oxygen to contact the wine, the wines will get oxidized. And uh, that means that your wine will have a very short shel shelf life. It could start to smell like fingernail polish. Uh, fortunately, corks are somewhere in the middle. And because they have co-evolved with wine, uh, we have been able to have a closure that lets in about the right amount of oxygen into a wine over time as it ages in the bottle. Screw caps, about half the amount of oxygen. Synthetic corks are about twice as much. So, um, but if we look at the reliability of corks, corks have very low reliability as opposed to other closures that have high reliability such as screw, screw caps and synthetic corks. If you look at this as we did, you realize that there is a place in the market for a closure that has high reliability but has the oxygen permeability characteristics of a cork. And that is the product that AEC is hoping to fill. Our system is basically a screw cap with a different sort of liner uh, that uh, the liner goes into the inside of the screw cap. There's an exploded view. And, um, and it basically, the, the cap holds the liner against the bottle and makes a seal. Our screw cap is a little different in that it has these holes in the top, which basically just allow oxygen to touch the top of the liner. They also will give us an a, opportunity for some ingre ingredient branding so that when people pick up a bottle of screw cap wine, they'll be able to see the little ring and say, oh, this is a AEC closure and they'll be willing to buy it over some inferior screw cap. Uh, the liner itself, this is the exploded view. Uh, the way it works is that there are individual layers of metal sandwiched with a polymer such as low-density polyethylene here. And in order for oxygen to diffuse through the entire matrix, it has to go through one hole and then sideways. That's important. Remember, sideways. There's a quiz later. And then down through another hole. Because of this sideways transfer, this thin film behaves exactly like a much thicker uh, cross-section of the same material, so we can create a, s a thin liner that fits into a screw cap, but actually acts pretty thick. So depending on the, um, the diffusion properties of this liner, uh, we can pretty much engineer the diffusion rate that we want. What's even better is that we can change the number of apertures, the, the number of layers, the materials that we use, uh, the thickness of the layers, all to dial in a specific amount of oxygen that is going to be appropriate for the style of the wine being bottled. Now, speaking of wine style, we talked about how corks are appropriate for, uh, for red wine, but that's on average. When you look at wine styles, as, as wines get more and more tannic, they need more and more oxygen. So light wines, screw caps are actually very good for, for light white wines. They start to kind of lose traction around Chardonnay and oak-aged whites, and as you get inker, darker and towards inkier reds, you need more and more oxygen. The problem with corks is not only are they unreliable, but they're highly variable. It's a natural product. There can be a lot of internal cracks that can't be sorted out. And so if you ever open up multiple bottles of the same wine and notice that a lot of them are different, that's why. It's because corks are highly variable. Now, AEC, we can engineer exactly the oxygen transmission rate that we want. So what that's going to allow us to do is not just have one cork-like closure, but to have a whole range of separate closures that have individual uh, oxygen permeability properties so that a Pinot Noir can have its own style of, of, of closure, a Cabernet can have a closure that's going to work for Cabernet. This gives a level of control that the wine industry has never had. As a winemaker myself, this is 
what I want. This is, this is something that I invented because I want to be able to say, this is a light wine, I want it to age for 10 years, and this is the closure that's going to let that happen. With the cork, you just don't know. Now, of course, the idea is great, but the team is, gonna w is, is what's going to make it happen. Uh, I've already introduced myself. The rest of my team is Diana Mejia, and uh, she is a food engineering master's student right here. Uh, she also worked as an engineer for Anheuser-Busch and uh, Barry Calibut. Kevin Chartrand is our financial guru. He is an MBA classmate of mine. He's also, you'll see him twice more. Uh, he's also on three of the top five Big Bang teams, so he's doing something right. And uh, he has a BS in material engineering and is a former Thin Films engineer for IBM. Our mentor board is also very good. We have Professor Robert Smiley, who is a wine industry economist. He's been studying the wine industry for over 10 years. He serves on multiple winery boards, and he's going to be very helpful in making the connections and the relationships on the uh, senior level that we're going to need. Uh, we also have jo Dr. John Crockta, who is the guy who invented uh, the, the edible whey films here on campus, and he specializes in mass transfer across barrier films, so he's helping us with our engineering. We also have two other advisors who we don't have pictures of, but they're here tonight, so you can meet them. One is Jim Morris, who is our uh, marketing advisor. He is the guy who brought Aquafresh toothpaste to market. Uh, we also have Mike Hart, who's our general entrepreneurship advisor. He's a serial entrepreneur, currently the CEO of Sierra Railroad and Sierra Energy. Uh, of course, this is a business plan competition, so let's talk about the business. This is the, the global wine market broken down by price point and color. As you know, we are looking after red wines, and we're also further going to refine that market to the premium price segment, which is between $3 and $14 per bottle. Above that, uh, the industry is pretty fractured, and a lot of people are going to hold on to corks for the issues of uh, tradition. The economy wine segment, these are bag-in-a-box or they're jug wines, so they really don't need our, 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 uh, our solution anyway. So our target is this 24%. Since wine, there's 2.6 billion cases of wine produced every year. Uh, this is still 590 million, 560 billion million cases of wine uh, with a dressable market of 3.9, 390 million. Sorry, I'm juggling my numbers. To further break down the market and look at it by country, on the vertical axis of this graph is the current screw cap adoption rate. As you can see, Australia and New Zealand have very high adoption rates, followed by the United States is around 12%, and the rest of Europe kind of trails that. Uh, on the x-axis here is the order in which we're going to enter these markets. So, and the size of the bubble is the size of the market. So our low-hanging fruit is right up here in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we're going to hit them first, come then come back to the United States, and then using the money that we've bootstrapped by kind of hitting the, the soft targets, we're going to enter, enter Europe. Uh, what's really interesting about this graph, and it doesn't show you, is that this is 2006 data that was reported in 2007, and these two markets were around here in the year 2000. So once an industry decides to change and it's going to kind of go the way of the screw cap, there's a lot of follow-on kind of thing. A few, people, a few major people move, everybody else follows. Uh, when I was working with Professor Smiley this last summer as his intern, we interviewed a lot of wine industry CEOs, and the general statement was, when it comes to screw caps, we, don't want to, we may not want to be the first person to the door, but we're definitely not going to be the last. So we know that as soon as we can say, okay, there's a screw cap that's actually really great for premium wines, um, we can have explosive growth. Our business model is that uh, we are going to outsource our manufacturing to a contract manufacturer. There are many of these uh, food, uh, food packaging companies. We're going to sell our liner to screw cap companies, such as Alcan, Global Cap, G3. There's numbers of these as well. We are going to also, though, market uh, much like a pharmaceutical company would market, in that we are going to uh, provide sales, sales support, tech support. We'll help people get it on their bottling line, make sure that there's no problems on the day of bottling. Uh, and we're also going to market to the end, end customer. One of the great things about wine is that there is a lot of wine-specific media channels. So we can put a full-page caller ad in Wine Enthusiast magazine for $10,000, and we can hit exactly our, our segment that we're worried about, and we can do it very cost-efficiently. In the case that the screw cap companies don't want to play with us, we can also outsource the manufacture of the screw caps themselves. Uh, there's companies in China that do this, and then we can sell to the wineries directly. Pricing uh, for the AEC screw cap is going to be very competitive. Uh, current screw caps cost 15 cents a piece. Corks, they vary very widely by, uh, by quality, but they average around 20, 20 cents. Foils are another 11 cents a piece. Uh, our screw cap liner is going to cost 5 cents a piece. Um, and inside someone else's screw, uh, screw cap, that is 20 cents, 
uh, and savings of about 10 cents per bottle. Now, if you're a big company like Constellation Brands, this could save you $68 million a year, so it ends up piling up pretty quick. In terms of our market uh, penetration, our first year, we're going to be raising a seed round of money of $150,000, almost all of which is used for our patent process uh, and legal. Uh, we have bench testing that is currently underway where we're testing the, our prototype closures uh, and we'll be filing our domestic patents. In phase two, years 2009 through 2012, we're going to raise a series A fund of uh, one million. We're going to do a bottle aging trial, secure our international patents, and then start rolling out our company into another major market about every six months. Finally, starting in 2013, we're going to start shopping our, our company for an exit. And uh, <coughs> we have some pretty conservative uh, numbers for market share. Uh, the, you can see our, our EBITDA. These are all in millions. Uh, we think that for a company that only needs about a little over a million dollars to start up, that this is a pretty heavy, uh, pretty attractive return on investment. So to sum up, we are a, we have a patent pending te technology that's based on very pr proven, very conventional science. We have a product that solves a major problem. We have a talented team. We have an industry that's primed for rapid change and adoption. We have a highly efficient capital investment, and we're currently raising $150,000 to get off the ground. If, uh, and if you are in that boat, I have a lot of business cards. I'd love to talk to you. Thanks a lot. This is Arcus. Arcus, we are developing a glucose monitor that's completely non-invasive and painless for glucose monitoring. It does this by measuring levels through your breath. It's completely non-invasive and it's a small handheld device. So before I go any further, I'd like to introduce the rest of the team. Hi, I'm, <coughs> I'm Alan Simotis. I'm a PhD student in biophysics and prior be uh, before coming to Davis, I uh, did research at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Uh, my name is Jamie Catano. I'm a third year JD MBA student with a background in molecular biology and a focus in patent law. Hello, my name is Matthew Hoops. I'm a, a third year biophysics student here at UC Davis, and I have a background in chemical engineering and previous experience with uh, biotech startups in the Bay Area. My name is Davin Shea. I'm a second year uh, MBA student focusing in finance. Prior to GSM, I have uh, worked in several biotech startups. Thanks, guys. And I am Matt Vogel, a uh, second year MBA student here at UC Davis focused in marketing. I'm very excited about this project personally because I have diabetes myself. I've had diabetes for 18 years. Before coming to get my MBA, I was the top sales rep at a diabetes company. So I understand the market, I understand the industry, and I have multiple contacts, um, both medical and business in the diabetes industry. So the problem we're addressing is glucose monitoring. People with diabetes, in order to monitor their glucose today, have to poke their finger with a lancet, draw a blood sample, and put it on a chemical strip. In order to do this, in, in order to, to manage your diabetes, you have to do this two to eight times per day. It's a, a painful process. Um, there is a biohazard with the, with the blood exposure. And because of all this, it reduces the amount of testing. So people with diabetes don't test as often as they should because of these reasons. Now, I'm an adult, and I'm fine with testing two to eight times per day. But imagine if you were a parent having to test a child, or your child that was a newborn, or two or five years old, having to get their finger and poke it to, to get a blood sample two to eight times a day. I hope you can, can see the problem here. So our solution, the Arcus solution, you know, this is a, a concept design here. Um, you're prompted to exhale and you blow into the bottom of the device. Uh, chemical sensors will sense the blood sugar and give you a reading. Within a few seconds, it also has wireless uh, capabilities and it will talk to a PDA or a cell phone or a computer and uh, log in your blood sugars so you can use that information and take it to your doctor's office to make uh, decisions about your diabetes management. Looking at the market, Diabetes is pretty much in the news every day. It's expanding with uh, epidemic proportions. Within the, the world, there's 246 million people with diabetes, which equals to a $169 billion testing market. Now, that's just the, the testing strips alone. That doesn't include insulin or syringes or anything like that. Uh, and the annual growth for the, U for the world market is 3%. 
boil that down to the U.S. market, it's 19.2 million people with diabetes, a $10 billion testing market with an 8% growth rate. Now, I've seen lots of diabetes companies come and go. The successful ones understand the complete diabetes network for the business, and those include four key players. The first are the patients with diabetes. Those are people with type 1, type 2, and gestational diabetes. They're the end users of the device. The second uh, key customer are the physicians and the nurses. They're the ones that treat the patients with diabetes. Uh, they make management decisions, as well as write prescriptions for the patients. Now, doctors and nurses, they're not going to write prescriptions unless they feel comfortable or confident uh, in the products they prescribe. So in order to be successful, you really have to um, pay attention to those key opinion leaders. Next, the, the patients take the prescription to the pharmacies and retailers, so Long's Drug, for, for example. And lastly, and probably uh, most importantly, are the insurance providers. Insurance providers are the primary payer of all diabetes supplies. They cover anywhere from 50 to 100% of the cost. So in order to be successful long term, you have to be plugged into the insurance networks and the insurance companies such as uh, HealthNet, Pacific Care, and Kaiser. Our business model is a basic razor, razor blade model, where we have a durable piece that just pretty much houses the electronic components. Our cost is $50. We plan to charge $100 for that. Then there's a disposable piece which holds the actual sensors, and that piece will last three months. The cost for production is 130 and we plan to charge 600 for that. Based on what glucose monitoring costs today, looking at six tests per day without insurance, the costs are $2,700. With the Arcus product, it's a little bit lower than that with $2,500, so we believe the pricing is, is right in line. The technology, um, there are recent studies that have found a strong correlation between blood glucose and exhaled chemical vapors coming out of your breath. So we're using that technology, um, or those, those studies. And those studies were used with uh, fairly large desktop devices that aren't, um, you really can't put them in your pocket and they aren't very portable. Well, we know of a technology um, that are small cantilever sensors pretty much a, a chemical nose that will sense um, these chemicals. It's about you know, the, the size of a matchbook, so it's really easy to uh, put this in your pocket. And they're, they're cantilevers, so imagine a, a diving board that are covered with polymers, and when they sense a certain chemical, they start to bend. So the more chemical it senses, the more it bends, it produces a, uh, uh, electrical output, and then that's how we get the uh, blood sugar reading. Now, this technology was originally developed for military purposes, so it's very robust, it's very durable. It was made for soldiers to carry around with them in the field. So again, this is a, an ideal technology for people with diabetes just to put in their pocket for, for regular glucose monitoring. Where are we with IP, intellectual property, and patents? Um, currently, this technology was developed at a national lab, and we have applied for the option to license the technology. Using that option of license, we'll explore it for ourselves, um, explore the proof of concept, and develop our own prototype with R&D. After we do that, we'll file our own patents based on improvements we've made on that technology to move it for the diabetes market. Competition. Um, our first tier of competition will be the traditional glucose monitors that are out there now. They're the big guys, J&J, uh, &J, Roche, Bayer, and Abbott. We believe their, their first response is going to be to discredit our accuracy, um, saying, you know, uh, breath analysis isn't as uh, accurate as glucose monitoring. We plan to, to preemptively strike that with lots and lots of clinical trials, which we'll hand out to doctors and nurses beforehand to say, look, Arcus is just as accurate as glucose monitoring. The second response could be a price reduction. Uh, regular glucose monitors have a pretty big price margin. Um, so they might be able to lower their price. Well, based on market research, we found that people with diabetes are willing to pay a price premium for a painless blood glucose system. Some weaknesses of these big guys, they're using painful technology, and they're also very big, which makes them slow to move. You know, I've been inside these companies, and they have meetings to have meetings. So it's really hard for them to react quickly to a new technology or a new competitor. We've also identified some other breath startups in the space, uh, Breathe Easy Systems, Exhale Diagnostics, and Philips. They're using chromatography and spectroscopy. Uh, their weaknesses are these technologies are not very portable, and they're only looking at one chemical, where we're looking at multiple chemicals uh, in the breath, so we get a much more comprehensive picture of what the glucose actually is. 
our team, which is probably the most important part. I am the, the CEO and president of Arcus. I've led many sales and consulting teams and look forward to, to leading this team until we get funded, and I'm sure I'll ask to, to step aside, which I'm happy to take a, a marketing or a sales role at that point. Um, Davin Shea is our controller. Matt and Alan will head up R&D. Uh, Lucinda Ross, she, is, she has over 30 years of actual clinical diabetes experience, and she's gonna head up our clinical department with all that experience, and legal will be handed by Jamie. Again, we have uh, the open positions of marketing, sales, and regulatory, and we'll fill those um, when the time comes. Looking at our timeline, uh, year one, we need $850,000 through an SBIR grant or an angel investor, and we plan to use that by testing the accuracy and proof of concept for the idea and developing a prototype. Year two, more development, we need $2 million to do our internal preclinical trials and refine the research and development. Year three is the big one. Those are our clinical trials. 3,000 patients for each clinical trial, and that's $2,500 per patient. Um, so it's a, a pretty big expense. Not as big as a, as a pharmaceutical, but um, we need 20 million for that, which will be devoted to clinical trials, clinic and home use, and we'll test under multiple conditions. Year four is when we submit to the FDA, filing under a 510K uh, application. As soon as you file to the FDA, you can start marketing at the industry-specific trade shows, talking to doctors and nurses, and start building the demand. And so that's what we plan to do, as well as ramp up our operations. And in year five, we'll get FDA approval. We can launch the product, start marketing to the healthcare professionals with a nationwide sales force, and start selling direct to patients. Now, we look at our, our funding timeline. Um, you know, again, we're, we're in development and are in, excuse me, uh, FDA approval until year five. Once we hit year five, we'll launch the product, and we already make um, a net income of over $19 million. So we've already overcome all our expenses from the first uh, five years. And in year seven, it equals over $200 million in revenue. And as you can see, up to, up to year 10, we already hit $1.2 in net income. So it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Our profit in five years, break even in five years, and gross margins of 68%. Besides diabetes, there are other applications for this technology in medical diagnostics. Um, just the coronary and stroke diagnosis alone is $24.6 billion. There's also an industrial application for this, uh, sensing industrial toxins, which is a $7.6 billion market. So in summary, Arcus is revolutionary technology that will allow people with diabetes to painlessly monitor their blood glucose levels. The next steps are to explore the proof of concept develop a prototype, and start our internal clinical trials. Now to us, this is more than just a business plan. It's about improving lives. Diabetes, is, uh, diabetes affects everybody, regardless of age, gender, sex, uh, socioeconomic status. This is just a small sample of the 19 million people with diabetes, and at Arcus, we plan to improve those lives of people with diabetes. Thank you. Good evening. Um, we are here to present CEDAR. We are very excited about this. Uh, CEDAR is cost-effective demand response. I want to uh, I want to introduce with my team first. He, with me here, uh, Joel. Uh, he's the inventor of this um, very exciting technology. He's um, uh, uh, currently serving as CTO in our company. Also in the student uh, team, with myself, Siwa, and Kevin uh, are our team members. What are we talking about today? We are talking about energy crisis. We know in California and also in the world there is more demand than the supply can, um, can actually overcome in the energy sector. So, uh, in fact, the demand is growing twice as fast as uh, the supply. Uh, in addition to that, we need to focus on the peak demand. What am I talking about? Peak demand means, let's, let's think about a hot summer day in, in California, in the afternoon, everybody turns on their ACs. Um, the, the, the commercial buildings are working full time. Their computers are on, their lights are on. That's the peak demand we are talking about. We can kind of make an analogy like you are driving in California's highways, 
uh, in the rush hour. There is the peak demand. And peak demand actually is, there's an expected growth of the peak demand in 18 to 20% over the next decade. And if we, if we would like to just provide a supply for this peak demand, um, we need to actually invest more than $300 billion uh, over the next decade and $12, 12 billion dollars per year. That is enough to power more than 100 million homes. So why should we care? Why don't we just let the government do uh, their job and, and uh, provide supply for us, right? Why should we care? Well, there are three things. Capacity margins. First of all, we are really reaching that capacity. So NERC, North American Electricity Reliance uh, Council, they forecast blackouts in, um, starting in 2009 onwards. In fact, this actually started in Canada back in 2007. Uh, we all remember 2001 blackouts. 2001 rolling blackouts caused more than $25 billion worth of damage in, uh, to the state of California. So this is why we need to care. The second point, okay, why don't we just build infrastructure for this? If we want to build infrastructure just to overcome the peak demand that we are going to uh, come across over the next 10 years, we need to, just in California, we need to actually build more than 160 power plants, small power plants, in the next 10 years. In addition to that, we need to build 15,000 miles of transmission lines. Well, there's a demand for clean energy, so we need to actually build our power plants with natural gas. So that means we are actually going to spend our natural gas reserves for this supply demand. What can be done? Well, we can reduce peak demand. And how can we do it? Well, you all know the answer now. We can do it with cedar. <laughs> <laughs> cedar is a connection between, um, between the utility companies and commercial buildings. So our first market segment is we are focusing on the uh, lighting um, peak load in the uh, commercial buildings. So if you, if you look at the graph over there, you can see the big chunk of the peak demand comes from commercial building lightings. This is our working prototype, prototype currently in, in CLTC, California Lightning Technology Center. And um, it's, it's currently being tested for reliability and, and uh, scalability. Here we see bi-level switch. I'm going to talk about bi-level switch, so let me show you. With bi-level switch, uh, I, I mean two switches. You, we are all familiar with this. Commercial buildings in California have bi-level switch. So you, you have the option of turning one, the other, or both of the lights on. So with Cedar, we are addressing uh, this, this lighting load in commercial buildings, and we know this, this, uh, this load is increasing. And if, if you look at the graph, I just want you to focus on the top line, the pink line. That is forecasted lighting loads in the over, over uh, the next years. It actually, uh, the, the graph starts in 1980, and it's, it's projected till uh, 2016. So we can see in the commercial buildings, lighting loads is going to increase. During peak hours, 12% of the load comes from the lightings. And we don't have, currently we, we have no cost-effective retrofit solutions for this system. And CEDAR is going to provide that. We have a lot of demand response programs and demand response competition out there. They are state of the art, but they don't retrofit. So you have to build a really expensive infrastructure to overcome, uh, to be able to use their system. Uh, we are, as I said, we are focusing our first market segment is California, and in California we are focusing on the lighting technology, uh, lighting load, and the reason for that is this bi-level switch. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. So our uh, market, uh, market opportunity is 1.5 billion sales potential. Why we chose California? Why, uh, why we chose lighting? Because of the Title 24. California is the leader in a lot of sense for um, so many things. And um, with Title 24, since 1983, California mandates bi-level switch in their commercial buildings. However, this is really not enough because it really gives the option to the consumers, to the end users, to be able to, you know, during the energy crisis, switch one of the lights off or on. And statistics shows more than 70% of those people actually keep both lights on, just like we keep right now. So this is why we focus on California and uh, to be able to use this available infrastructure. 
And in addition to that, utilities in California have rebate incentives uh, that is available to us. So our business is going to be uh, built on the, these incentives. We have two uh, rebate programs right now. In every uh, kilowatt uh, energy you can save, there's a one-time $250 rebate, and then there's an annual $96 rebate. So our future market opportunity, uh, opportunities, as I said, lighting in California is our first market, but then uh, our system is very applicable to any other load that comes from air conditioning, residential pool pumps, or any other plug loads or energy management systems. Are we just focusing on California? No, because energy crisis is really not only California's problem. It's, it's, it's in everywhere. Um, for this, we are actually currently developing a light dimmer system. And this map is, again, a forecast showing the um, upcoming blackouts that's, that's expected to be seen in all over the United States or, and Canada. And uh, this west part is already experiencing blackouts. In fact, just yesterday, my daughter said that they have power outage in their school. So we are experiencing bl blackout every day. And, um, and it's going to be, become more often. But all over the United States, these blackouts is going to come uh, more and more often also in the, in the um, East Coast. Uh, and in Canada, actually, during winter, they have these peak demand responses. So with this, I'm going to leave Joel to describe our technology and take it forward. Okay. There we go. Okay, this is a diagram of how Cedar works. What we do is we put a sender that uses ordinary lamp dimmer signals, which are very robust and mature, at the fuse panel, and we use it to modulate power going to a receiver, which is in the bi-level switch. This button represents any method the utilities choose, and there's a lot of them they're looking at, to automatically, during a power crisis, limit you to half of your lights. We're not fussy about which half you have, but you only get one half. <laughs> Once the crisis is over, you get your lights back. And I'll save some energy right now. <laughs> Most of our competition is focused on energy efficiency, which is a great thing, but it doesn't do a thing about the peak demand crisis. They're also mostly focused on new construction. Retrofit is much larger opportunity than new construction. So we maintain a good quality of lighting. Half your lights, you can still work. And we have excellent cost of installation and product cost. Our management team, in addition to the students you've seen today, are myself. I have 25 years experience in electrical engineering, and I've helped start and grow a couple uh, engineering departments. Our CTO, Al McBride, has three startups under his belt, 35 years in technology and management, and he's so excited about the opportunity, he's actually working for free. And in addition to that, Jim Benya, is the official consultant to the Title 24 Commission, the people who say you must put two switches in the building and are coming up with new rules all the time. He's the one who thought this idea up based on his experiences and that there was a large unmet need for demand response and lighting. Our advisory board includes the members of California Lighting Technology Center across town who helped us develop and refine this idea and introduced us to the utilities and regulators who are now partnering with us to bring it to market, as well as the EEC, which is helping us not only develop the product, but the company to go with it. And we have the two largest California utilities partnered with us, helping us to do demonstration sites this summer, and they're keenly interested in our success. The California Energy Commission has actually given us some funding, as mentioned before, a quarter million dollars to start our development and prove the concept. We base our market penetration on historical data from electronic ballasts. Like electronic ballasts, Cedar, or electronic ballasts like Cedar have, were benefiting greatly from utility, regulatory, and ESCOs promoting them, and we're gonna get the same level of support 
We install this at no cost to the customer. We can do that because of the $250 per kilowatt, which pays for our hardware, and it pays for local lighting contractors to install this. There's an annual rebate. We give a third to the customer to bribe them to help. We give a third to ourselves, and we give a third to the lighting contractor, and this is key. The lighting contractor now has motive to maintain the system, so it won't just break and be disused. Our key milestones are we're going to go cash positive after the first year. Actually, that's the second year because they've already given us money, which we were very grateful for. And we'll have $15 million sales after the fifth year. Also very important is in 2011, they're coming out with a new Title 24 code. We're going to lobby to have our technology included so that new construction will also start buying it. As mentioned before, we got funding from the CEC. Southern California Edison, largest utility in the state, is our partner in the program that CEC is funding to help us be a success. Our future milestones are that we're going to finish our field trials this summer, prove the technology, and then we're going to finish recruiting the management team and start our marketing. Sacramento is the hub of the local regulatory community. It's where a lot of us staff live and a lot of our partners are in this area, so we're definitely going to stay in Sacramento. And since the good folks of California ratepayers are paying for all this, we're going to plow that much money back into the economy through all the local contractors. Thanks for your attention. Before we begin, I want to ask you guys a simple question. Have you ever been traveling somewhere to another country or another area, and you went to a restaurant, and the waiter poured you a glass of water, and as you grab for that glass of water, before you drink it, you pause for a second, and you always wondered, if I drink this, will that send me to the bathroom all night? <laughs> now what if you can take something simple as this, a tea bag, put into your cup of water, let it sit for a few minutes, and be able to drink it knowing that it's safe, it's clean, and it tastes good? If your answer is yes, then I think I have the solution for you. My name is David Wong. I'm here to present our business idea, Purity. Now, Purity itself is a technology that delivers clean, safe, effective cleaning agents for anybody at the home, in the office, or travel. And the way we do it is through our revolutionary nano beads. Now, you may ask yourself, okay, well, how is this tea bag that I have in my hand, how does it really work? Well, let's get right into it. The technology itself is based on the heart of the technology here, which are called nano beads. And these are really microscopic beads that are really, vis you can still see it, but they're almost tiny, almost the, the width of a pencil tip. And within these nano beads contain thousands of nanoparticles. These nanoparticles are engineered specifically to clean up contaminants using two methods. One, through catechol reduction, which is actually absorbing me metal ions from the water. So if you have lead or copper, it'd be able to extract that as it passes through. Or another way, which is chemical decomposition. So if you have a very complex uh, chemical or co component, you can actually break those strong hydrocarbons that are usually takes a lot of energy to break, break those down, and all you have are harmless byproducts. So what you have here is really the driver are these nano bees and nano catalysts. Now the great thing about this is that we're dealing in nanotechnology. What nanotechnology means is that we're dealing at the atomic level. Now the benefit of these nano bees is because of the size and the flexibility and able to engineer any which way we want to, we can actually apply it to many different things. This tea bag here is just an example of how we would use it. Now we know this works because it's already been tested to successfully remove trichloroethylene also known as TCE. It's an industrial solvent you find at a lot of dry cleaners, a lot of um, industrial plants. It's a runoff. It goes into the seeps in the groundwater. And the way to clean now is using activated carbon to soak it up, pump it out. Problem is it takes a lot of energy. And so what we found is a gold palladium mixture for those nano beads can actually remove that at 100% efficiency. So it reduces cost, reduces overhead, and reduces waste. So one of the other questions, I guess, 
I might as well answer now is, well, these beads, are they going to be deadly for me? If I eat them, how's it going to work? And that's a, a re, you know, it's, it's a question everybody comes to, but I want to lay to you the fears that these aren't bees, they're not something you eat, or they're able to be swallowed. This is a design, design area where something like this, a tea bag, the filter paper would have the nano bees embedded within them. So they would stay within the bag itself as it soaks up the contaminants, simply pick it up and throw it away. And there are two things we know is that the gold and palladium are non-reactive and safe, and we're going to follow the same methodology for any application in the future. So now we've talked about technology, so where is the really market opportunity? Well, as you know, the market, the, the water purification market is actually pretty big. Uh, you see clean water has gotten a lot of awareness about how supply is going to run out in a, in a couple of years. Um, you may have seen read newspaper articles of how you see pharmaceutical traces of chemicals falling into our water supplies. And this larger awareness that, oh my God, if I drink tap water, is it going to have those things in me? Eventually over time, is it going to get worse and worse? Well, there is, and that's why people have spent a record $2.7 billion in 2007 on Brita filters, Pure filters, and it's projected that by 2010, the, current the, the market size is going to be about $413 billion. This is worldwide now. But the problem is, is that with this technology, there's really no solution for portable, portableness, portability. Right? You have it at your home, you have your, your Brita filter at home, you have it at your faucet attachments, but when you go traveling, you can't obviously carry that with you. You go to the office, you go traveling, hiking, how do you carry something with you? Something like this would solve that problem. So before we get into uh, our actual strategy, let's talk about other players that are there. The other two technology players in the market we're familiar with are activated carbon and reverse osmosis. Now your Brita filters, we always mention, already has that the black little pebbles that we call charcoal activated carbon. What it does is it soaks up all the contaminants. And reverse osmosis is a different mechanism where you basically push water through a membrane to catch all the particles. Now the problem with these systems is that while they're very effective, they need larger equipment to actually work. Obviously it's not very portable. Secondly, if you want to make it portable, it's not going to be cost effective. They cost upwards of $50 to $100 if you want it. And in a particular place of reverse osmosis, you just waste about 75% of the water just to get that little cup that you want. Now here's where we, our advantage stands in is that our flexibility and portability give it the ability to apply to many different applications outside this tea bag, as well as being able to identify specific contaminants if we wanted to choose chlorine over lead or whatever. We have a combination of a lot of things, but it's a question of how we want to engineer and what the requirements are. And then finally, because they're micro we're dealing with microscopic sizes, the surface area to ratio is so much more effective than what we have today with activated carbon. So in, in effect, you can have a teaspoon or a tablespoon of this stuff and be effective almost as a large bucket of activated carbon. So now let's understand, where now, now we understand the market side or the market, um, the market opportunity, we've got to talk about who our customers are going to be and how big the size really is. Right? So what we do know is projected sales of water systems is projected to be $3.4 billion in two years. Uh, today, I'm sure I'd say probably 60% of this room owns a Brita filter of some sort at their home, and that translates to about 150 million U.S. customers that actually have either use a Brita system or drink water bottles. And from our rocket research, we know 65% of you would be willing to pay extra for something like this to carry around with you. So knowing that, that means about 100 million potential customers would translate close to 2.2 billion market in only two years, and this is a growing rate at 4%. So you can imagine the possibilities. Now, if we look at our consumer segments, consumers value really three things, right? One, is it going to be portable? Is this going to be portable? Two, is it going to be cost effective? Is it cheap? And three, is it going to be effective, right? And so if we look at those criteria, we, we segment our, our customers down further, and those will be the folks who would actually use it. Those would be the folks who are in travel. Those would be folks backpacking, hiking. Those people would be in the office. You've seen those big old tea bags around. What if that same big old tea bag could clean the water as you drank it? So it proposes a, a large opportunity. So great, now we understand the market size and then we know our customers. How do we bring it to market? Well, let's take for instance a tea bag. We look at the supply chain and how this tea bag gets developed. It really goes through two major steps. One 
is the manufacturer of the actual filter paper, and two, actual Lipton or Beagle company that actually puts material together, packages it, distributes it, markets it to the customer, and finally sells it to the supermarket. And so our idea is to partner with the manufacturers and the product partners to help co-develop this, uh, this demo beat specifically for their use, application. So this is just an instance, right? And we talk about how much it'll cost. Well, we projected for 36 months, we require about $800,000. To complete, our, to, to complete the research and development, secure the partners to help co-develop and collaborate in the design, how these nanobees will work, and then finally release it to the market. Now, this is a very conservative estimate. We're talking one partner here, but if we look at attaining a new partner once a year for the $800,000 investment, within five years, we're returning upwards to $4 million, with a return investment of about 100%. So this is really, if you think about this, and you think about, take for a second, to envision how else you would be able to use this nanotechnology? Well, outside of water filtration, uh, or water, water, uh, water cleaning, we move on to coffee filters, tea bags, um, bags for the military, so when they're overseas and they're in the battlefield, they can use something like this to clean their water from a local water source. Um, aquariums, hospitals, uh, hotel chains, restaurant chains can offer this as a premium uh, product in their suites. And so we kind of start thinking about how these nanoparticles, nanobeads can be applied to more and more areas. The potential is unlimited, really. So I want to briefly go through the folks who are going to make this happen. Uh, of course, uh, I'm the CEO. I come from nine years working at a lot of Fortune 500 companies, including eBay, Yahoo, uh, Cisco Systems, and uh, Accenture. Um, our CFO is Soyin Shi. He uh, works at Washington Mutual as a risk, vice president of risk, uh, credit risk management, and he managed a $3 billion portfolio. And finally, the key is our chief technical advisor, Dr. Michael Wong. He's a chemical engineering professor at Rice University and also the head researcher at the Nanomaterials Laboratory. And I'm sure you guys are asking, is he related to me? Yes, he's my brother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, is a, he is a smarter one, but I like to think of myself as a better looking one, so. And finally, we've assembled a, a panel of key advisors to help drive it through this, uh, ranging from business development, marketing, uh, fundraising, and legal. And so what I wanted to impress upon you today was that the future for water purification market is going to be huge. It's on the upswing for a big revolution, and Purity aims to be the front runners there. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really thankful, a little tense, to bring forward the Little Bang winning WICO. It's a first product by Green Technology Innovations, and I would like to start off with the introducing the team. Dick Bond, who was unable to be here, is the inventor of the WICO technology. Myself is an associate with Energy Efficiency Center, Emerging Venture Analyst, and with me here on the stage is Kevin Chartrand, as you all see in chest about an hour ago, is officially the fellow of entrep entrepreneurship. <laughs> and finally, I have Emine, who already presented one of our ideas. So coming to energy efficiency, on the right of this chart is what is called a messy energy spaghetti chart. All he's trying to show there is how much energy we've consumed in the United States in 2002 and how bad of a job we've done. So we've consumed 103 exajoules of energy in 2002. If you try to make it a dollar amount, it's about $4 trillion. And what that shows up there in the blue block is all the energy that we've wasted. And that is 60% of all energy that we've consumed in 2002 going to waste in, in various kinds of systemic inefficiencies. And that makes energy efficiency the most cost-effective resource for future. And to take this point all the way home, the Public Utility, Utility Commission and the Department of Energy has made efficiency number one on the loading order, even in front of, ahead of renewables. And finally, that opens up the $2 trillion latent efficiency market. So we have a number of ways to improve efficiency. Go to cars, it's not that easy. Go to some other places, it's much, much better and much easier to do. But we've, as a team, identified one particular segment 
where it's much easier to improve efficiency, but hasn't been done cost effectively. And that is cooling of commercial buildings. The commercial buildings consume about $20 billion of energy, um, and 20, 18 to 20 percent, a fifth of that usage, is just going towards air conditioning. And out of that, 70 percent of all commercial building cooling is achieved by rooftop air conditioning units. And from now on, I'm going to make it short and call it RTUs. So that, makes, that brings out the vision for our company. As a company, Green Technology Innovations, our full-scale, long-term mission is to manufacture and sell retrofits and replacement air conditioning devices to commercial buildings. <clears throat> so what exactly is wrong with rooftop air conditioning units, and what are the problems associated with it? As we all know, I'm pretty sure this building is being cooled with a rooftop unit. So <clears throat> the, all, all the rooftop air conditioning units do is take air, condition them, and provide cooled as a service. And as a byproduct, you, you have pure water condensation on the other side. I'm pretty sure most of us have seen split units outside our house where you have a constant dripping of water. And that's exactly what we're talking about. And that water is, is pure and also a source of energy that's not captured. And that's what we want to do as a company and use that to improve the efficiency of these units. So somebody, apart from the energy issues, we also have, because it has to be condensed and then it has to be piped out to drainage, we use pure copper piping right now. And that's not, it's very expensive to install. And apart from that, we have increasing cases of theft. Actually, this idea came out from LA, where one of the commercial buildings had a constant theft problem. And we're like, what can we do to take it out? We said, we can improve efficiency. That's the problem. So, so Wicool. So what exactly Wicool does? Wicool is a first of its kind, an elegant solution to capture some of that wasted energy in the form of water to improve the efficiency of RTU units. And how do we do it? Simple. So this is the status quo of an RTU unit. You have air coming in on one side and water condensed on the other side and piped to drainage. And all we do is reroute that water into a tray, collect, it, collect the water, put a wicking media, evaporate that, and pre-cool the air. It's as simple as that is. And that is our proprietary technology from Western Cooling Efficiency Center. So apart from being a very cost-effective, easy to install, and a number of things that we could add on to this, and it's payable in less than a year to a year and a half, it also improves the efficiency by 4 to 9%. So it saves up to $500 per rooftop unit annually. So if you look at a big box Walmart chain, which has typically 15 to 20 units or the top of them, it's about $10,000 that they save in energy consumption per store. And apart from that, as, as we all know, the cooling is most done during the peak hours, during mid-afternoon, and during which you have higher energy costs. And because we improve the energy efficiency during that time, we reduce costs in peak load. And finally, as we improve efficiency, one of the great things that happen with efficiency is improve the system, um, system life. And how do we do it across the um, United States? Are we just good for one region and not for another one? So this is how we do it. Uh, one of the key parameters that we depend, the performance of WICOOL depends on, is the relative humidity in, in air. So as you look here, um, the relative humidity kind of increases as you go towards the east, and our system actually performs the most optimally when the relative humidity is between 50, 55% to 70%, and that is yellow and orange. That's half of the United States. So if you look at the east, if you look at the west coast where the energy prices are really high, we have a market, and as we go east, we improve more efficiency, so we have a market. So WICOOL's addressable US market. We are going after all rooftop air conditioning units in the United States, which today are estimated to be about 4 million units, and out of which we have 800,000 units just sitting on retail chain stores. And the reason why we kind of isolated that and blowed up, blowed it up to show how many Walmart and Target has, which is 100,000, 50,000 units, is because our company, GTI, the WICOOL, has signed agreements from both Walmart and Target to evaluate this technology over the next six months. That's what we're doing. So let's look at this revenue potential. We are priced at about $250, $250 on an average, and that makes it a billion dollar business. Very easy, a lot, lot there for grabs. And <coughs> we, we have, on, in Walmart sales, we have about $25 million in revenue potential and target 12 million. If you look at them together, it's about $37 million, and 10 to 12% of them are in California. So if we can just capture California's market in the first year, that's $4 million in revenues for a company. So finally, so how are we going to do this? 
we're going to go after retail chain units first. And the, the good thing about this is we don't have to worry about installing this. All we have to do is ship them directly to them, and they have their own service personnel, and they do that. And that's our first target market. Target and Walmart are on board already, and we're waiting for Safeway and so. And secondly, we're going to go after other commercial buildings which have rooftop units, schools, warehouses, hospitals, etc. Right now, we're in talks with UC Davis to try and uh, expedite this into, into one, of, one of the buildings, actually GSM, we're trying to do it, and thereby bring on, the, uh, bring on achievement of carbon neutrality goals that we have. And finally, we also, we also would like to uh, develop this to sell along with new air conditioning units, which are like about 100,000 units every year. The way we're going to do it is directly sell them as an add-on with new rooftop units. And right now, we are in talks with Lennox, which is one of the largest manufacturers. And the pricing model, we've debated on this a lot and took a lot of input from a number of people here in this room, and we finally changed the pricing structure. It's based on a simple razor razor blade model to have one-time high revenue and the recurring revenue coming every year. So we can make this weak cool unit, which, by the way, you guys can all see here. This is our first prototype we just got made two days ago. We're excited to show this. I'll, I'll lift it up after everything. <laughs> and um, it can be made in less than $40, but we get selling at $250, which gives us a margin of about 100 and, I mean, we can make more than that. That's a conservative estimate. And finally, we're also going to, the media has to be changed because it, it becomes affected by mold, depending upon how extensively you're using this. Um, say, in California, you might need to replace every two years versus in Miami, where you have to do it every year. So that gives us a recurring revenue. And I'm going to pass it on to Kevin to look at the competition. Thanks. All right. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the competition and a little bit more about our financials and some upcoming stuff, which we're extremely excited about. I got all the, the good stuff to talk about, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the competition uh, in this market is actually relatively limited. Uh, there are a couple different uh, segments that these fall into. One is called evaporative, uh, evaporative condenser precoolers. Uh, and there's a couple different types. The basic idea is you take some external water, you pipe it up to the roof, you either drip it in front of the air or you spray it up uh, from the bottom, and it cools the air uh, like you'd expect. The problem with this is that there's minerals in those water. That water is not clean or 100% clean. There's actually some very large lawsuits going on right now uh, from a company that sprayed a whole bunch of minerals onto uh, the condenser coils and uh, basically destroyed a, a whole bunch of RTU, unit, RTU units. Um, next, there's an active condensate missing unit. And uh, what this is, is essentially kind of what we're doing crossed with what I was just talking about. They're taking the, the clean condensate, which is great water, and then piping it back in and misting it. But this still requires pumps, and it still requires misters. And so there's still a lot of uh, things you have to do, some maintenance, some motors, some electricity. And we want to get away from that. Uh, third, there's the status quo. A lot of people have RTUs. They're paying their energy bills. Why should they change? Well, we think that we can save them enough money to actually uh, change their mind. And then fourth, there's some brand new uh, ideas coming out, uh, some um, uh, units that use uh, technology similar to ours. Uh, these are only new units and are only owned by one company right now. So uh, even if we're in talks with some OEMs, uh, we believe that we can capture some of this market as well. So in our competitive matrix, you can see at the top that WIC Cool just, well, it just plain rocks. Uh, we can do everything. Uh, we're passive. It's cheap. Um, it's got low installation costs. Uh, it's energy efficient, and it's a retrofit. Um, so any unit that's already installed, we can uh, we can make better. Uh, our team is actually very very exciting. Uh, Steven didn't say too much about Dick Bourne, but Dick Bourne was the associate. Uh, excuse me, he was the director of the Western Cooling Efficiency Center, and he's actually stepped back uh, his duties at the Western Cooling Efficiency Center to help commercialize this project. Uh, this is his baby right now. In addition to that, Dick has about 19 other patents that he's going to bring with him um, to found a company around Wickcool called GTI, and so we'll have about 20 different patents to commercialize in the in the in the coming years. And of course, uh, you've, you've already met Siva, um, and myself, and m and who was up on stage earlier. Also, we have some great, great industry support. Our advisory panel is, uh, well, it rocks too. Um, we have some entrepreneurs on there. We have some manufacturers on there. Uh, we also have, uh, oh, actually, a brand new one. Um, let's see if I get this name right. Susan Herndon, who is the VP of Commercial Products at Lennox, wanted to be on our advisory board. And so we just signed her in, in the last week to be uh, one of our advisors. 
In addition, we also have some key uh, centers, like actual center, center partners. Uh, the Western Cooling Efficiency Center, who has a great track record of commercializing products, and the Davis Energy Group, and the Energy Efficiency Center. So some key milestones that we've already hit. If you'll notice, we actually just came up with this idea late last year. In that six months, we have filed for our patent, we won Little Bang, we've done our record invention, all that wonderful stuff. We've also, this is pretty key, uh, have uh, um, secured two pilot testing agreements with Walmart and Target in the Sacramento area. They've already signed letters of intent to roll this out all over California if it, uh, um, uh, if it works like we say it would. They've also given us $10,000 to help do that. And uh, what we've got up there, we've got prototypes manufacturing. As you can see, we've manufactured our prototypes, so we've already hit that. Uh, funding milestones, actually prototypes is the first one on there, so we can cross that off the list, put it on a previous slide. The pilot tests are going to go for the next six months. Uh, Walmart and Target have agreed to that. Uh, we hope to flush out the, uh, the team um, that's going to bring this all the way to market by the end of the year. We hope by the middle of 2009 that we can bring this to all uh, Walmarts and Targets in California. And then uh, we'll be launching in the South and the Northeast in 2010, 2011. Because this is a very rapid ramp up, we believe that we're going to need Series A financing uh, probably at the end of 2008 to help us with the manufacturing and the sales. And as you glean from some of the other ones, the th uh, three major things that we're focusing on right now are conducting the pilot tests with Walmart and Target, uh, choosing an OEM manu uh, <laughs> manufacturing partner. Uh, like we said, we're in, in talks with Lennox, and so we're very excited about that. And we want to finish our, our management team. And with that, uh, we'd like to thank you. While everyone's casting their vote, I would like to introduce our final speaker for the evening. Kevin Coyle is a partner in the Sacramento office of the international law firm DLA Piper. Kevin's practice focuses on corporate and securities law with an emphasis on startup companies and business transactions. Kevin has been involved with the Big Bang since its inception and continues to be an invaluable asset to this competition. In addition to being our platinum sponsor, Kevin is a member of our advisory board and provides guidance to prospective contestants through the workshops in the fall. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Coyle to the stage. You know, I'm not sure that I have any important revelations about the Big Bang, but I do think if there's a core message to this event, it's that the UC Davis Big Bang Business Plan Competition has become a key component in the continued development of an entrepreneurial culture here at UC Davis. When I moved to this area in 1992, UC Davis had a, was well known for having a long history of innovation, but fairly or unfairly, it had not developed a reputation for entrepreneurialism. That began to cha change in the 1990s under the leadership of Dean Smiley and with the help of many, many others, many of whom are in this room today, both inside UC Davis and outside in the community, the university began to more overtly focus on entrepreneurialism. Not that the university wasn't involved in entrepreneurialism, but, but more that they needed to make the community aware of the opportunities being developed at UC Davis. I went back and looked up some numbers. 1996, uh, University of California Technology Transfer published some numbers on uh, innovation and, and intellectual property being developed at uh, UC campuses. Turns out that in 1996, UC Davis Tech Transfer reported 400 total active inventions cases, and only one-sixth of those actually were plants. Okay. At that time, to, to give us some comparison, some of the, the more well-known universities for entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism, such as UC Berkeley, had 424. UCLA, 509. Powerhouse UCSF had 605. So UC Davis was obviously in, uh, innovating and developing plenty of intellectual property. So it seems to me that the problem was, was more of a perception problem, whether there was an actual problem. In 2000, Casey Kanan approached us and other members of the high-tech industry in Sacramento with the idea of starting a student-run business plan competition along the lines of UC Berkeley and Stanford. The basic idea was to match up Davis business students with Davis technology give the students a chance to pitch their ideas to real life VCs, maybe start an actual company or two, and have some fun. We obviously thought it was a good idea. And once GSM and some other sponsors got the, bought behind the program, it was launched. The goal at that time was threefold. 
First, we wanted to educate students in the process of creating and evaluating new business ventures and prepare the students for opportunities in entrepreneurship sometime during their careers, whether in startup companies or established businesses. Second, we wanted to facilitate interactions between the local technology companies, local venture capital groups, service providers, and other community resources, as well as the university professors and students. Third, we wanted to harness the unique resources that UC Davis and its communities offer. Added to that has been the experience that the student volunteers receive in organizing and running the program each year, including the rather scary business of having to ask sponsors for money. In that first year, uh, Andy, 50 companies registered. Um, of course, we were fairly liberal in our guidelines for what, how much UC Davis connection there needed to be. But interestingly, the winner of that competition, Emergent Software, and the runner-up, Visual Calc, both have been funded and are still actually going strong. There were a couple of years of consolidation and development. Um, and then our next sort of significant milestone, I think, occurred when UC Innovation Access and Meg Arnold launched the Little Bang Poster Competition, which we've heard about already today. This, in my opinion, greatly expanded the scope of our project and helped to generate significant interest in the Big Bang among non-business students. During this time, we also received continued and, and increased support from, from the D, uh, GSM and the dean and the faculty members at the graduate school. To date, we have had well over 300 official, you know, reviewed submissions to the Big Bang alone, and many more companies and, and projects participating in the Little Bang poster competitions. Our finalists come from a myriad of industries. These include enterprise software, biotechnology and life sciences, medical devices and diagnostics, semiconductors, consumer products, we've had internet companies, nanotechnology, material science, green tech and energy, we even had a food service company win one year, and yes, of course, there are plant and animal science companies as well. That's not too bad for a quote unquote ag school. This year's finalists continue this trend. Clearly, energy efficiency is a hot topic this year, uh, here and everywhere else. Uh, we also have companies in the medical device and diagnostics, nanotech, and material science. Or is that actually better tasting wine industry? I wasn't quite sure where you guys fit in there. Clearly, UC Davis is on the cutting edge of today's technology. Now we can all imagine a day when we're sitting in an efficiently cooled room, thanks to Wickcool, enjoying a perfectly aged AEC capped bottle of Australian Shiraz at the premium price point because we've saved so much money on our energy bills. Those grapes were watered with the purest water imaginable. Mmm. But it's a hot day and suddenly your cedar switch turns off all the lights. <laughs> so it's time to go home. But before you leave, you check your blood sugar slash alcohol level with your specially modified Arcus device, which hopefully you can use even in the dark. <laughs> so how have we been doing since 1996? Okay, I have some more numbers for you. Uh, by 2006, the UC uh, Davis invention portfolio had more than doubled from 400 to 831. In 2006 alone, UC Davis had 158 invention disclosures that happened to be third in the UC system behind UC San Diego and UCLA, but ahead of our friends in the Bay Area, UC Berkeley and UCSF. Not that we're keeping track or anything like that. <laughs> Total active patents managed at UC Davis had increased from 168 to 391 over that 10 year period. A remarkable record of innovation. That said, innovation and entrepreneurialism at UC Davis are clearly more than a few selected data points. What we all know now, whether we can measure it or not, is that entrepreneurialism has now become a vibrant and growing sector of the UC Davis community. UC Davis now boasts a variety of startups in clean energy, nanotech and material science, medical devices and biotech, in addition to its established competencies in plant and life sciences. This is something we should all be proud of. Dean Biggert and Dr. Harganon and the rest of the GSM faculty, all of the community supporters, and especially the students, research assistants, and professors here at UC Davis. I'm honored to be a part of this community and look forward to many years of continued success.
I would also like to uh, put another uh, shout out to the judges this year, the, the folks that were here today. As I mentioned every year, these are incredibly hardworking people who don't have a lot of time, and yet every year they come out and devote a significant amount of time to judging these, these plans. You know, the, the, the secret really is that it's a heck of a lot of fun. Um, so it doesn't seem like a lot of work, but still it's, it's an incredible amount of effort that these folks put, put in. So thanks to Scott, Roger, Pete, Harry, Ian, and Brian. Thanks again so much. And finally, I thought I'd leave you with some words of wisdom on the process of the business plan. In the beginning was the plan. Then came the assumptions. And the assumptions were without form. And the plan was completely without substance. And the darkness was upon the face of the workers. And they spoke among themselves, saying, it is a crock of crap, and it stinketh. And the workers went unto their supervisors and spoke unto them, the plan is a pile of dung, and none can abide the odor thereof. The supervisors went unto their managers and said unto them, the plan is a container of excrement, and it is very strong, such that none can abide it. The managers went unto the directors and said to them, it is a vessel of fertilizer, and none can abide its strength. The directors spoke amongst themselves, saying to one another, it contains that which aids plant growth and is very strong. The directors went unto the vice presidents and said unto them, the plan promotes growth and it is very, very powerful. And the vice presidents went unto the president and said unto him, this new plan will actively promote growth and efficiency of this company and certain areas in particular. And the president looked upon the plan and saw that it was good. And the plan became policy. And that, my friends, is how crap happens. <laughs> Thanks very much. OK, we've gone to the part of the competition that everyone has been waiting for. Oh, that's not supposed to be the end. Uh, but that doesn't matter. We are still going to be presenting the awards. We will present the People's Choice Award first, then the runner-up and then the winner of the competition. May I have the envelope for the first? OK. Whisper it in my ear, Brandon. <laughs> I'm very pleased to present this year's People's Choice winner, Arcus. Congratulations. The second place award uh, will receive $5,000 in prize money. And the winner of the second place award for the 2000 Big Bang Business Plan competition is Arcus. And now the moment you have all been waiting in heavy anticipation for, the winner of this year's Big Bang is in an envelope. And I will tell you in just a second. Thank you. The envelope, please. The winner of this year's competition is Advance Analogical Closures.
ahead. <laughs>